While we absolutely know that they wouldn't have celebrated Thanksgiving like we are this weekend, I had fun this week imagining what Thanksgiving dinner might have looked like at Jacob's house. What a mess. So there is Jacob's elderly father, Isaac, who dies in this story. And Genesis doesn't tell us precisely when his mother, Rebecca, dies, but it seems like probably before this point. After all, Isaac is 180 in this story. Then there's his older twin brother, Esau, with whom he has just reconciled after something like 20 years of estrangement, because Jacob tricked Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob that was supposed to be for the oldest son, Esau, and Esau was mad, understandably. And then there's all of Esau's family, which I'm not going to talk about because you don't have all day. And then there is Jacob's immediate family. So while Jacob was in exile after tricking his brother, he stays with his uncle Laban and Haran, who in turn tricks him into marrying Leah when he thinks he's marrying her younger sister Rachel. Laban then agrees to let Jacob also marry Rachel in exchange for seven more years of service. Leah gets pregnant quickly, and by the time of this story, we hear that she has six sons and at least one daughter. Her oldest son, Reuben, is Jacob's heir because he's the oldest. And as we just heard in this story, Reuben sleeps with Jacob's secondary wife, Bilhah, understandably putting him in his father's bad books. The other sons of Leah are Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Leah is also the mother of a daughter, Dinah, who doesn't get named in the genealogy because the Bible is notoriously bad about naming women, which means there might be other daughters, but she's the only one who gets named. And in the chapter of Genesis, just before the one that was read, she's raped, and her brothers Levi and Simeon hatch this complex scheme to murder all the inhabitants of a city, ostensibly in revenge for what happened to Dinah, but really for their own profit. This puts the whole family in danger, and Jacob is not very happy with them. Then there's Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife, the one he wanted to marry in the first place. Well, it turns out she has trouble getting pregnant, so she sends her maidservant, or her slave, Bilhah, to Jacob as a wife. And Bilhah has two sons, Nan and Na Dan and Naphtali. And then not to be outdone by her younger sister, Leah also sends her maidservant, Zilpah, to Jacob as a wife, and Zilpah has two sons, Gad and Asher. And then, finally, when she's just about given up hope of ever having a child, Rachel does get pregnant and gives birth to Joseph, Joseph of Technicolor Dreamcoat fame that you're going to hear more about next week, and Benjamin, whose difficult birth results in her death in childbirth, something that was not particularly uncommon in the ancient world. So I bet that makes whatever complicated and messy family dynamics you have around your Thanksgiving table seem much less dramatic somehow. And yet, these stories have been preserved for us in Holy Scripture because people saw God at work in them. From Jacob's 12 sons come the 12 tribes of Israel. This is an origin story of great significance in our heritage. Are Jacob and his family flawed, sometimes so profoundly that they inflict deep and lasting wounds on one another? Absolutely. Does God still bless them and bless the world through them? Yes. I think we often make the mistake of believing that blessings are something that come to those who deserve them. That they are somehow earned. We like this myth, and it's a big myth in our culture. This myth that if you do good, you'll get good things. Because it means if we do the right things, then we will surely prosper. That we have control over what blessing comes into our life. But God's blessing doesn't work that way. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talks about God's blessing like this. You're familiar with the old written law love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you. 
not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer, for then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. God gives blessings, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless. The good, the bad, the nice, the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anyone can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner can do that. In a word, this is what I'm saying. Grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. God is generous with blessings. They flow like the rain to the good and the bad, the deserving and the undeserving, the right and the wrong, in absolutely equal measure. Just like Jacob and his family, we get all kinds of goodness in our life that we haven't earned and we don't deserve. And this is a cause for great thanksgiving. But it is also an invitation to live equally generous lives. We are invited to be God's blessings in the world and to allow God to bless others through us. Today is World Communion Sunday and tomorrow is Thanksgiving here in Canada. Both provide us with opportunities to pause and to notice our blessings. Like the prayer we just said reminds us, sometimes we walk past the most extraordinary blessings without even noticing what is happening. Where do we see goodness and grace in our lives? How does beauty find us? Where has love sustained us? And where has our life been touched by God, the indiscriminate giver? Bringing a deeper awareness to all the ways in which we are beneficiaries of unearned grace is an important first step. If we cannot see the goodness in our lives, then we will have trouble sharing it with others. Still, it is only the first step. Then we are invited to share that goodness so that it blesses others. Blessings aren't things that we are meant to hoard for ourselves. They are gifts to be shared as freely as God, the indiscriminate giver, shares them with us. So this Thanksgiving, as you pause to give thanks for the blessings in your life, take a minute also to consider how you can be a blessing in the world. How can your gratitude overflow in generous living? What gifts do you have to offer to the world? Who needs your love and care right now? You don't have to have your life all together to bless others. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, as we see time and time again in the Bible, you can be deeply flawed and full of mistakes. You don't have to be rich or knowledgeable or confident to bless others. You simply need to be willing to offer what you have. You simply need to show up, be present, share, and love. When we do that, everyone has much more to be thankful for. Thanks be to God.